good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Carl Blumstein. I'm the uh, director of the California Institute for Energy and Environment and the director of the Citrus uh, Sustainable Infrastructure Program. And uh, to today's um, talk is um, uh, supported by both. Uh, and uh, uh, the speaker is um, Sasha von Meyer. So it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Sasha von Meyer, with whom uh, I've worked for uh, many years. Um, uh, um, I wanted to, not, I'm the age where I'd say, oh, and I knew her as a graduate student. <laughs> Uh, but she's quite remarkable. Um, uh, she is uh, an, now an adjunct professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Berkeley. She teaches um, a, a must-take course if you're interested in electricity. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's a two-semester course. And uh, if you want to know about electric power uh, from the ground up, you need to read Sasha's book. Uh, and uh, take a class. Uh, and if you can't take her class, read the book anyway. <laughs> uh, she is, uh, um, the little blurb here says um, she directs the electric grid research program at the California Institute for Energy and Environment. Her work is driven by the vision of a nimble, adaptable, and resilient electric power infrastructure that optimally recruits resources such as solar, <laughs> solar photovoltaics, energy storage and electric demand response to support the transition to a carbon neutral grid. Her current project focus on use of high precision microsynchrophasia measurements for situational awareness, diagnostics, and control applications in power distribution system. Sasha. Thank you for the very kind introduction, Carl. Um, my pleasure to be here. How's the sound? Apparently fine. OK, so there's a story with us. I was supposed to give this talk at the ARPA-E summit exactly a week ago in Washington, DC. For those of you who haven't been to the ARPA-E summit, this is the Department of Energy's Advanced Research uh, Projects uh, Agency for Ener uh, Energy. It's a big deal, big colored glossy production, you know, the exhibit show and whatnot. Um, and it was the only time I remember that I've actually called an airline a couple hours before my flight and said, I can't fly, I have the flu. And uh, so I, my colleague Sean Murphy uh, from Pink Things was kind enough to give the talk on my behalf at the summit, but then, um, Carl asked me if I would give the talk here, and uh, I'm delighted to do that. Um, it's not very dense on the technical side because the talk is intended for a very general audience, but it's also short, so hopefully we will get into some of the technical details in Q&A and discussion. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm all better except I have a lingering cough, and I'm gonna try to warn the sound person before I cough into the lavalier mic. Um, uh, with um, some good luck and some water, we will um, get through it. So um, it's actually a real pleasure to be here speaking about this microsynchrophaser project. Some of you may remember actually Five years ago, I was here with um, colleague Alex McEckern from Power Standards Lab, and we talked about the very beginning of this project. Um, so we are now in the last two quarters of a plus up that was awarded after we finished the original uh, three year project that was under the uh, Open 2012 solicitation. And uh, we had a number of illustrious partners um, in academia and industry, including, of course, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, Power Standards Lab, a number of electric utility companies where we went and tried out the synchrophaser technology. And then in early uh, 2017, we embarked on the Plus Up project that was really the continuation 
to work on commercializing some of these um, applications that we uh, had begun to develop in the uh, initial phase of the project and to work specifically with companies that were well positioned uh, in the field as uh, commercialization partners to take the microsynchrophaser data and algorithms and incorporate those into products that would be ready to um, be sold in the industry. And so those three partners, you see their logos, uh, Ping Things, Doosan Grid Tech, and Smarter Grid Solutions, and then uh, some additional uh, utility companies with whom we are uh, working to demonstrate some of these technologies. Um, so to sum it up in just a single slide, what we've done in this project is we've built technology. Beyond technology, I think we've created a we've created the basis for a new way of thinking about managing and analyzing distribution systems using fundamentally a different type of data um, in uh, observing how power distribution systems work, how they operate, and be able to control them with really more refinement um, in uh, particularly uh, in, in the temporal dimension. Beyond that, it happened that we actually really seeded, we planted the seeds for uh, a new community to grow around this type of analysis, which I'll talk about at the end, but we've had several follow-on projects that are taking the ideas we initially tried out in this RPE project and are developing specific applications for specific um, areas. And in fact, the picture um, in the corner here, that's um, my student Mohini Baria, uh, working with uh, some um, students from the University of the Philippines in Diliman, as uh, our, in the context of our PICARI funded uh, project. Um, where it's just one example of how we're um, working with others to kind of spread the word on this um, technology and approach. So starting with the hardware part, and some of you are familiar with that, um, the new gadget that uh, was built by Power Standards Lab um, is this micro PMU, micro phaser measurement unit. Um, and that's a device that is a very precise time synchronized electrical measurement um, device specifically designed for power distribution systems in contrast to power transmission systems. And what that implies is that you have to deal with a smaller signal to noise ratio, you have to deal with smaller measurements, um, and so it demands more precision um, of the instrument. It also means uh, that we're working in an environment in a context where historically there's been very little empirical data gathering, very little knowledge about power flows on distribution circuits, you know, between your house and uh, the utility substation. Um, and of course, as we all understand, with the advent of distributed generation and also wanting to exercise more intelligent controls of electric demand, it's necessary for grid operators to actually see what's going on on those circuits. For example, there are you know, new opportunities for local resources to be providing services at the, uh, at the transmission level in the electric grid. For instance, if you have a battery resource, you could be providing, uh, you could be doing arbitrage, you could be providing services into the electric grid. But at this moment in time, it's very difficult to assure that such local resources aren't causing some local disturbance in the process of trying to help the system globally. So for example, if I'm performing frequency regulation services uh, with a resource that's located on a distribution circuit, I might be screwing up the voltage for my neighbors in the process of ramping power up and down to try and help the system frequency. Um, so with more uh, distributed resources, and of course electric vehicles are a big player in this, as is solar generation, 
there is certainly a need to have a greater visibility at the distribution level and also uh, for, for really for recruiting diverse resources, for improving efficiency, but also for generally improving reliability and having the, the resources and the ability to be more responsive or resilient and adaptive as extreme events such as weather events or who knows what compromise um, the grid functions. So the crux in making uh, these synchronized measurements is really about very precise timestamping and the gray device that you see um, in the slide there, that's a GPS receiver. So the particular feature that's unique to the micro PMU is being able to measure and resolve the very, very small difference in timing between two AC voltage waveforms at two different locations. And because the timestamp is taken locally um, and associated with the datum, it doesn't matter how far away the other point is. Um, you then aggregate the data and compare them. They each come with their timestamp. But so just for illustration here at location one and two, we would have a power flow down this uh, distribution circuit, which to a first approximation, that's a synchronous alternating current system. So the voltage sine waves should be exactly coincident, except they're not really exactly coincident when you look closely. It's that very small phase shift that we call <coughs> delta in this picture that actually physically drives the power transfer uh, down um, a wire or through any, any AC circuit. Now at the transmission level, phaser measurement units have been recognized for, uh, for quite a few years actually, started uh, in the late um, 1900s uh, with the, really the GPS technology enabling PMUs. It was after the 2003 Northeast blackout that there was really a big momentum toward installing PMUs, or they're also known by the data they produce, which are the synchro phasers, the synchronized uh, phaser measurement, where a phaser comprises a, an RMS magnitude of a voltage or current quantity and a phase angle, which represents that timing. Um, so the synchro phasers, really became a um, more popular technology. After the blackout, it was realized that grid operators really didn't have enough situational awareness, didn't see enough about what was happening on the grid electrically, and so they were vulnerable to surprises. Um, at the distribution system, no one had really made synchrophaser measurements before because it wasn't known that whether it was possible, in fact, to make as precise a measurement because the voltage phase angle differences are very small. And then of course there's the issue of, you know, the economics of installing sensors in, uh, in an environment where there's basically less money behind each sensor that you install, there's less load behind it. Um, so it would have to be less expensive. You have to get the cost down from the tens of thousands into the single thousands, maybe ultimately the $100 uh, range. Here's an example of um, a field installation with the micro PMU um, that comes in a box. And we learned a lot in the project about you know, the, the importance of having um, easy to install, easy to work with um, hardware in the field. You see the GPS receiver on the top uh, of the box and then there's a little salt shaker which is the uh, antenna. So for pl uh, locations in the field where we don't have ethernet, we had uh, cellular wireless uh, communication. And Power Standards Lab, since this initial project, has installed hundreds of these and sold them to different uh, utilities, uh, people doing research projects, and um, so the, the hardware itself is now well, um, well in, uh, in its, on its way to uh, commercialization. I mean, it, it is fully commercial, and I think word is getting out about what you can do with these. They're really very versatile instruments, but the first concern that would you know, come up um, if you're a utility installing these is that 
there's a lot of rich data here. And how do you even manage this data? Um, these are streaming at 120 hertz to frames per cycle. And you have uh, six channels for each quantity, three phase voltages, a magnitude, and a phase angle. And then you may have three phase currents, a magnitude and a phase angle, so that's 12. Um, 12 channels, 120 data points per second, that uh, adds up pretty quickly. And so to be able to really use these data, really a crucial development in this RPE project was a database that allows you to consume the data in a meaningful way and in a way that doesn't just add to your workload as an engineer, right? You want to get actionable intelligence out of it rather than, you know, be spending time searching and sifting through data. And a big, um, and actually a metaphor I like to use is it's sort of like reading through, a, browsing through a magazine. You don't have to read every word. You want to be able to kind of look at what's interesting to you and then zoom in on it. But this database, the Berkeley Tree database, and Michael Anderson, who's a PhD student um, here in uh, computer science, really was the, the genius behind this uh, design, um, is a way to allow you to look at the data at different levels of resolution and have the power to look at it in real time as well as in an archival manner. So we have a data archive, but there's also the streaming data which gets ingested very, very rapidly um, and that can be observed essentially in real time for operational uh, kinds of applications. And Michael has recently done some experiments and testing uh, on the scale up and has shown that yes, you can in fact have thousands of micro PMU data streams going in um, to a cluster and, and managing that data flow. Um, in, in this case, 53,000 streams, uh, which is quite an accomplishment. And this is very much in contrast to the conventional way of dealing with measure, measurement time series data um, in the industry where you are really either looking at it in very low resolution, for instance, every few seconds you get a data point, or if you are doing a power quality kind of analysis, you might be looking at the waveform and the time domain and you have a lot of data points, but you wouldn't be doing this continuously, you would be doing this for a few specific incidents that you study closely and then discard everything in between. So, this illustration just shows um, the kind of scale of the range of our ability to zoom in into and out of these uh, data streams. And you can have many more than one. Um, obviously, some of the interesting analytics are going to have to do with comparing streams from different locations. But here, just for illustrative purposes, is a voltage magnitude trace that spans a few weeks in this graph. Um, the density here on the screen, we're showing 264,000 uh, data frames per pixel on the screen. And we can immediately see that, be, and this is because of the tree structure uh, in the way the data is, is stored in BetterDB, you don't have to access every single leaf node in this tree, right? So we don't have to know what the voltage was during every split second of February 27th, but we have a minimum, uh, maximum, and uh, mean of these different time intervals. And so very, very quickly, the database can recognize that, well, on February 27th, there was a time when the voltage hit a rather low point. And now we can zoom in on this, and within much less than a second, the database will retrieve the individual uh, data frame here, and you see now our scale has changed into seconds, and the little dots are individual reports, of which we have 120 for each second. So within a small fraction of a second, the database has zoomed in and, and reported the actual minimum value. In this case, this is an operationally significant item 
this is a voltage sag that you might that might have um, operational consequences, as we'll see in an example later. So this has never uh, before been possible with um, with time series data to do at the speed. And one of our uh, commercialization partners, Ping Things, is very much in the business of doing analytics on big utility measurement data. Um, so their uh, platform is called Predictive Grid, is now using the BetterDB technology in a product that brings streaming data together. And interestingly, they are also looking at combining not just distribution PMU data, but transmission PMU data and other time series data that utilities might have. And that's been an area where the industry really is interested in having a platform that allows you to compare different types of measurement together and then ask questions uh, of the data. Um, so Ping Things is, is implementing a whole range of analytic techniques um, and have been working since, the, uh, since participating in this RPE project with a number uh, of different utilities and have had some follow-on uh, funding as well uh, for actually going out and installing their platform. Um, the other two uh, commercialization partners both are working in the context of distribution systems. Um, they're each dealing with controlling actual resources. In the case of smarter grid solutions, they're focusing on solar inverters um, and controlling them for the purpose of uh, voltage, intelligent voltage management. Uh, in the presence of legacy voltage regulation that doesn't always play nicely with um, solar inverters. And in the case of Doosan Grid Tech, they're focusing on controlling storage resources using microsynchrophaser measurements as, um, again, another input for more intelligent kind of control. I wanted to just give you a flavor um, of some of the data in a real life situation. So here is uh, a large solar array that is injecting power and that power injection is being measured at micro PMU number two. So that's over there. Um, and the current from that is represented by the blue trace, that's an amps. And then there's also a, another micro PMU that's measuring the net power flow at the substation. So that would be the power generated by the PV array minus the power that's being drawn by the load on the circuit, which is mostly residential load. Um, and interestingly, the, this is a case where the PV penetration is essentially over 100% because uh, sometimes the load is completely met by the solar generation and the power flow actually goes negative where this distribution feeder is injecting power upstream into the transmission grid. That's not necessarily a problem, but it certainly is something that a utility company wants to know if and when it's happening. Um, in fact, there are cases where there's really significant concern about protection systems being properly coordinated when you have reverse power flow. Um, in any case, you certainly would like to know if and when this is happening. Sometimes you might want to restrict uh, your distributed generation to prevent the reverse power flow. Um, so what's interesting here is on the, the brown, reddish brown uh, trace, we are seeing the substation current, which represents the net load really, um, but that is sometimes a forward and sometimes a reverse current and just from the current magnitude measurement you can't really tell the difference. In fact, it doesn't even exactly cross zero because there's always some reactive power flow that's um, kind of a, a curiosity there um, and the, the PV is generating at a unity power factor. So it doesn't necessarily cross zero and it's not obvious when the power is flowing in reverse. But the green trace is showing the, you the difference between the voltage phase angle measurements at the two different uh, PMUs. And you can see, actually I should have drawn a line right here at the zero. Um, 
it is sometimes above zero, sometimes a positive phase angle difference, sometimes negative. Um, and it's actually showing you uh, pretty clearly where it crosses over from the positive to the negative power flow. And you can see that it's sometimes the mirror image of the substation current. So that's just an example of a visualization that gives you a new level of insight into the power flows that are actually um, occurring there. So we did, in the course of the project, build a number of techniques and algorithms for essentially milking this data for different uh, types of information. In this case, um, the, the picture illustrated here on the right is an example of where the solar array suddenly stopped producing and everyone, including the plant owner and operator and the utility, would like to know, well, did that just misbehave or was there a good reason for it to do that? Um, and so in this case, we're able to show not just that it, the, the current went down to zero in response to a big voltage sag that occurred on the same circuit. We're actually able to trace it to the location where that fault occurred, which was the palm frond that inadvertently touched the conductor and, and caused this transient fault that went away and cleared, and the utility would never have known that that was going on, except what happened is the inverter tripped offline. And uh, so this is one way to really get good diagnostics on the behavior of resources. There's any number of other uh, questions you can ask of the data, starting with, well, what phase are we on, A, B, or C, that uh, the utility circuit models don't always have reliable information about? Detecting which switches are open or closed uh, that you would think would be kind of an obvious thing, but it's in fact not always known exactly what the status is or you would like to have sensor data to confirm that. So there's actually some very interesting math that you can do from some number of sensors that are deployed on a network being able to reconstruct, well, what do I know about which connection points have to be open or closed? There are examples, again, um, I don't have uh, the details here for you, but um, examples of detecting when an asset such as a transformer, a load tap changer on a transformer, which is a device that mechanically moves a contact um, on the secondary winding of a transformer to effectively change the turns ratio, uh, like of a, of a substation transformer, and this is, you know, an expensive device. And uh, in one instance, we're able to see from the microsynchrophaser data that one of these devices in the field seemed to not be behaving according to the way that we would expect. And the utility was able to go out there and take a look and say, hmm, yes, it looks like it's not feeling well. We should do some preventive maintenance here. Uh, so there's potentially great value in doing early diagnostics of, uh, of asset, you know, malfunctions. Um, being able to disaggregate how much solar generation is behind a net meter. So coming back uh, to this illustration, this is sort of a larger scale, but where, you know, here we're kind of cheating because for a control, we have the actual measurement of the solar injection. But when customers are self-generating with rooftop solar behind their net meter, the utility doesn't necessarily know how much load is being offset at any given minute by the local generation. They're just seeing the net consumption at the meter. Now, that can be a real issue, and it, in fact, is a kind of risk exposure for the utility, because they would like to know if, for some reason, that solar generation were to trip offline, for example, for no fault of its own, because there's a disturbance somewhere else uh, on the circuit, then suddenly the utility would be faced with that entire load that had been masked by the generation, and this would be a good thing uh, for them to know about. Um, so a lot of these applications have, um, have been worked on. In fact, there are any number of colleagues at uh, other universities as well and other labs that have 
been developing applications using these micro PMU data um, to estimate the full operating state, which is an interesting math problem. How few sensors can you get away with? Um, identifying uh, the impedances of the, of the network, even detecting cyber attacks. Um, and then there are some follow-on projects that we have that are looking into controlling distributed generation or other resources based on uh, these phaser measurements. So this is a paper that um, we published last year summarizing um, some of these applications. Really the big takeaways here are that we can think in a different, in, in a new kind of analytic scope where we can combine real-time online analysis with streaming data, combine that with the type of thing you would do offline, the forensic analysis of what happened here, how do we know that was a palm frond, uh, where we would use archival data, and we now have a database that supports kind of seamlessly moving between the two. A new way to think about um, grid monitoring is really the notion of taking information from a set of sensor devices and using it for many different purposes because the, the data is sufficiently rich and versatile rather than sort of the industry uh, default approach, which is to install dedicated sensors for dedicated uh, applications because somebody justified it with a specific use case. And so we're able to think more broadly about this. And then finally, uh, control applications to get more value out of distributed resources and good behavior out of them. Just a few words about some of the uh, sort of follow-on projects. Um, detecting cyber attacks is a really interesting application because, and in this case, uh, their uh, colleagues at LBNL and also Power Standards Lab working on this, um, you can use the micro PMU measurements to very carefully compare what the actual electrical status of the grid is compared to what your other instrumentation says that it should be and therefore identify if somebody is rehearsing an attack and messing with your systems without having necessarily broken anything yet. Um, there's also an effort, um, again, led by colleagues at um, Lawrence Berkeley and Livermore Labs about recruiting distributed resources for Black Start. If there were a very large outage uh, in the transmission system, being able to start restoring locally, uh, recruiting local resources, that's something that could be very important uh, for resilience uh, purposes that really utilities are not able to do now because it would be like trying to drive with your eyes completely closed. Um, there is also the thumper that uh, Power Standards Lab has developed, uh, which is a very cool box that's actually deliberately thumping the grid and inserting some disturbances that then can be picked up with micro PMUs some distance away to make inferences about the network in between and about the way that the system uh, you know, response to, to particular disruptions. This was never before an option because there wasn't an instrument to actually pick up a small load disturbance some, some distance away. And then I mentioned our uh, Picari project. We also have a collaboration going on uh, with Tecta Monterrey in Mexico and are looking forward to actually other international collaborations. So what is really most exciting to me personally is that this kind of community has sprung up of people doing distribution uh, synchrophaser research. The North American Synchrophaser Initiative um, now has a distribution task team. It used to be exclusively focused on transmission uh, synchrophasers. And at last count, we had 118 members in the distribution task team from all around the world, actually, not just North America. So that's uh, really exciting. In fact, the IEEE Smart Grid Transactions um, is working on a special issue dedicated specifically to um, distribution synchrophaser applications. Um, a very wise man told me that, um, you know, it's amazing what you can do when you don't worry about who gets the credit. 
And uh, it's, I think, so cool in this community that so many people have kind of come together to work on something that's not just about getting credit for specific research, but is really focused on a mission that we all care about. You know, a mission in the interest of society for really promoting a more reliable and, and more sustainable grid. And we're doing things here that five years ago, we really didn't know if they were gonna be possible. So RPE has a slogan, changing what's possible, and we think that that was actually sort of very fitting uh, for us. And um, I'm gonna stop for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sasha. <laughs> so it has been very interesting. Um, you know, in my, I can see the problem now in my house <laughs> from what you have shown me. Uh, it's like every time uh, on the high noon when production is very high, my inverter shut off, shuts off. And this is, and then it doesn't come on until somebody comes and resets it, or I, I can reset it, of course. Uh, but, uh, so I, I've been calling them to find out what the problem is, and uh, they say they have to get a new board in there for the interface because it's tripping when there's a high flow on the other direction towards the thing. Do you think this microphase somehow can help uh, the homeowners uh, to install something to get a early information so they can actually proactively do something about it? So I, th I think, yes, in theory, uh, no in practice in the sense that right now you wouldn't, as a homeowner, have enough economic incentive to you know, install a dedicated high-performance sensor for that. You would, you would have to have a certain size of a PV array to make it worth your while uh, to do that. You know, certainly if you had a big rooftop, if you're you know, Walmart or someone with, with a, a big sort of commercial scale uh, installation, then absolutely yes, it would make sense. And, you know, I, so I think part of it is the diagnostics of figuring out, well, you know, is this a problem with the device here or is this a problem that really has to do with the power flow on the circuit? So it may be the case, for instance, that at your location in the distribution circuit, the voltage just gets too high and it's not within the spec for your neighbors and therefore you know, your inverter is doing the right thing by shutting off. Um, one of the things that we'd certainly like to do strategically is to be able to do a more intelligent curtailment if it's needed of distributed resources mm -hmm. so that rather than shutting something off completely or preventing people from installing new distributed generating resources, as it would be the case now, where you say, well, the feeder hosting capacity has been reached, sorry, you can't put any more solar on there, the voltage is too high, we have reverse flow, to have a system in place by which you can elegantly and gracefully reduce the power output just during those times when it's needed, and then it comes uh, right back. Yes. you. Um Thank you for your comments. I noticed that in the beginning you had one of the icons for PG&E was also there. Do they have these um, synchrophasers in their yes. service model now? So, so we're working with PG&E out at the, uh, at the facility in San Ramon and mm -hmm. they have been playing with them and testing them and they now have uh, several of them installed and I don't actually know exactly where in the field so that's wow. Uh, an example of the follow-on uh, of the follow-on project. Yeah, we were in, the interest that I had was uh, the, in the last two years, January 2017 and January of this year, they raised prices on all of the bills, regardless of uh, discount for seniors and disabled, and regardless of uh, home income. And I was wondering if having more micro micro synchrophasers would in, would help them reduce those um, charges because they would be able to get in much more accurate flow? You know, I think that's a complicated argument to make um, because 
there are a lot of steps between you know the technology that you put in the field and how you end up calculating the rates for the customers, right? That's a really complex chain there, and I think you know you. It, it's really hard to say that any one technology would lead to a rate increase or decrease. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that in the big picture, the way that having better intelligence about distribution circuits could ultimately result in you know, lower rates would be by avoiding certain infrastructure upgrades and investments that turn out not to be necessary. Right, so it would be possible in specific situations to avoid or defer a many multi-million dollar kind of upgrade mm -hmm. that you realize, well, if we just take better measurements and manage things more actively, um, we can you know, maintain reliability and power quality without going into that investment. And I think what will be interesting in the years going forward is to see how utilities deal with uh, what we hope to be a huge onslaught of electric vehicles charging, right? Because that's a tough problem because each vehicle essentially doubles the load, you know, a typical load of a single family residence. Um, so it's a really big deal at what time that charger kicks in. Mm -hmm. And it's conceivable that there's a lot of transformers that wouldn't be big enough to accommodate that. So in fact, uh, some of the other work that is, is being done at Berkeley is about you know intelligent strategies for vehicle charging mm. so that you can avoid you know having to replace a bunch of transformers with m bigger more expensive equipment yeah. thank you question um, was there a identification of a trigger of what caused the 2003 event and any indication that MPUs could have given actionable information beforehand to respond in a better fashion Yes, so there's a wonderfully written report actually by the US Canada Task Force analyzing the 2003 blackout, which I actually assigned to my students as reading. It's that well written. Um, and if you send me an email, I will send you a link to that document. Uh, so there are really a number of, um, of factors that contributed. Uh, inadequate situational awareness was a key underlying factor. Um, and inadequate system understanding, not understanding what observations really indicated the stress level of the grid at that time. And you know, in a nutshell, what was going on was that grid operators in Ohio didn't have the awareness or the understanding that they were operating in a not secure mode where they were vulnerable to the next failure causing a cascade um, of, of transmission line uh, trips or you know, relay operations. So they were in a situation where they could have saved the day by shedding some load, they had some low voltage, and um, you know, a couple of things happened, transmission line shorted out with the tree and so forth. And it wasn't really any one specific incident that you could blame for triggering the outage. It was the state of mind of the operators being lost in the sense of not knowing how vulnerable they were. And when the phone rang from their neighbor saying, hey, you know, something's not looking right with that transmission line, they're like, I don't see a problem. Everything seems to be fine. And it's that, that disconnect of knowing whether the system is just fine or whether the system is teetering at the edge of a cliff that um, uh, system operators now certainly are, are using uh, PMU data to give them that indication. And here on the West Coast, what we've had, and there's also a big blackout in 96 along the West Coast, uh, that was specifically caused by oscillations between the North and South, power oscillations that we now understand to be kind of common, um, and we need to watch them, and we need PMUs to watch them. Um, that we now actually curtail power flows on certain transmission links to make sure that the oscillations are within limits and that there's proper damping um, of those oscillations. This is information that you couldn't get from conventional kind of data. Thank you so much, Sasha, for your talk. This is really fascinating and transformative work, and it's always fun to hear about it. And it's cool to see how you can use this data to really basically do detective work on the system and what's happening on the system. 
Um, I'm curious if you're learning, as, as you dig deeper into this data and see more case studies of it, if you're learning anything that gives you insight about um, as folks continue to deploy distributed energy resources on the distribution grid, what technologies, what kind of siting, location, you know, associated, you know, inverter control mechanisms, and uh, things that are more technology specific that tend to work better with the grid and maybe cause fewer of these disturbances in ways that really propagate through the system? I don't think that I can answer that yet. Uh, so, so if I understand your question correctly, it's, you know, what have we learned about sort of which technologies are better candidates for being good citizens on the grid or playing yeah. nicely? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, so I don't think I can answer that. I would say that in, in many cases, the, the weakness is not so much a function of the, techno the distributed technology that you install. You know, what are its innate capabilities? For instance, an inverter may have a lot of capabilities in theory mm -hmm. that are not activated mm -hmm. because of the way that the rules are presently written about what inverters can or should do. Uh, but the limitation is really about the coordination and having the understanding to know that, well, if we do have smart inverters and if we did have communication and a way to control them directly, what is it that we should tell them to do mm -hmm. in the context of what other devices are doing? Um, so I actually imagine that, you know, with a more intelligent and transparent uh, grid, it would be it would continue to be agnostic or would be more agnostic toward mm -hmm. what are the physical resources if they can meet certain requirements of you know responsiveness that are not that difficult to meet um, I think what we want to do is rather than being more selective is enable the greatest variety um, of devices as possible um, and have a you know coherent way of, of coordinating them and that's what we're working on with this uh, DOE-funded Energize project uh, on phaser-based control, is to you know, think about what measurements can we take from the distribution circuit that would then directly inform what these devices should do um, that would also account for the impacts of what their neighbors are doing, which might be unscheduled or not what their neighbors said they were going to do, or there might be some contingency, some line outage and what have you, um, so that rather than having to recalculate everything or having to recalculate a price, issue a new price signal, is there a direct control command that we can send meaningfully from the microsynchrophaser measurements um, that would have resources respond very quickly and in a way to restore uh, the steady state um, balance of operations. And, and we would want to design that uh, certainly to be agnostic to what's the device, you know, that the controller is talking to. So that's kind of the direction we're thinking. Thank you. Sasha. Um, so do you see the proliferation of those micro phasers kind of get us closer to reorganizing the grid with DSOs and DLMP at the, you know, locational marginal prices at distribution level to, as a way to manage distributed resources? That's a, that's a great question. So the DSO would be a distribution system operator. And, you know, again, I, it's going to sound like I'm not, I'm not answering your question, but I'm trying. Um, I would, again, try and be agnostic toward what is the actual... Insti the, the organizational form of taking the control, that is, what is the entity? Is it a utility entity? You know, what is the locus um, of control? I would think that having the high resolution data throughout distribution system would enable whomever it is to be making more intelligent decisions. I think, you know, there's, um, there's an intuition that says we want to have as much of the control and intelligence as possible reside in a distributed manner as closely to the devices as possible. 
um, so that you kind of minimize your vulnerability to communication bottlenecks and so forth and not leave the distribution system operator with an unmanageable problem of coordinating a million different devices, which they don't want to do. So the in, my intuition says we do want a kind of uh, layered um, kind of hierarchical structure or layered decomposition in that. But, you know, I don't think that the data per se says that you have to go one route or another. I think it's enabling um, a variety of options. Now, as to the locational marginal pricing, my personal intuition is that in distribution systems, if you really wanted to set meaningful price signals that reflect local constraints, you're going to have an unmanageable problem on your hands because you're going to have different prices for every house down the street. And I view, you know, and now this is conjecture more than um, something I can prove at this moment, um, but my intuition is that it makes more sense to control devices based on a direct physical measurement rather than computing a price which requires a model and then waiting for people to respond to that price which requires another model which is behavioral or lies within however you've programmed your automated devices to respond to prices. Uh, but to have sort of a more physical feedback and then do the settlement offline. Because another intuition is that as we move toward a system that is closer to 100% renewable resources, the intrinsic value of a kilowatt hour becomes less and less. And the value that we're talking about really is the connected capacity in kilowatts. And it's a value of responsiveness to the grid. You know, but, but the value of the unit of energy, that's sort of a holdover from the world of fossil fuels. And in that kind of framework, I might not have to worry so much, uh, if I'm, let's say, a solar generator, I might not have to worry so much about selling kilowatt hours and be concerned about, well, did I get curtailed here? I'm losing money. But I, I might, we might be seeing rates going more toward the ancillary services model where I get paid for my connectivity and my responsiveness to whatever the conditions happen to be. And that would facilitate sort of an offline settlement more than having a, a price response necessarily. Uh, on that note, I'm going to again thank Sasha, and uh, um, we are out. Of, we are out of time, um, but thank you very much for coming. And, and uh, there's more to come from this research, you, and you'll be hearing from us. Thank you.